Hello. And here we are. Five studies in the bag. We've listened hard to the words that Jesus uttered from the cross. We've sensed as we've listened hard how merciful he was to the end, what compassion he showed, what love he shared with his mother and his disciple, the agony he underwent, that scream still searching my innermost being, and the cruelty of those around him who gave him sour wine instead of an easy drink. And then we heard that he felt that he'd done his bit all over, the job's done, before he went back to his father, completed the cycle. The one from whom he came is the one to whom he returned. All that we've done. Love's redeeming work is done. Fought the fight, the battle won. Mm. Hallelujah. So they took his body down. And instantly, those characters that had been marginalized from the story, run away in the case of the disciples, kept tentatively at bay in the case of his mother, they come back center stage. Because now at last, they can be in charge again. Jesus was always one step ahead of them. They never quite twigged what he was all about, or they ran fast to keep up with him. But he always seemed to be ahead of them. But now, He's dead, and they're back in the frame. They know exactly what to do. They know death. They deal with it. They put the spices on the body. They lay it out properly. And then they bury him in that cave that was loaned to them, if you remember, by Joseph of Arimathea. There's a lovely story about that made up, of course, but it's lovely all the same. Mary is thanking Joseph of Arimathea for lending her his tomb. And he shrugs and says, well, Mary, it's like this. It's only for the weekend, isn't it? Which I think is a lovely story. Anyway, that's all now come to a conclusion. And they go to bed that night having done their best. And they wake up the next morning and boy, does the story break upon them. You know, on 24 hour news, rolling news these days, you get that flash on the bottom of the screen that says breaking news this was breaking news they went uh, the women to the tomb to see if all was all right if they needed to do any other little details uh, with the corpse as they expected it to be and they saw that it was empty and the stone rolled away they beetled back to where the lads were all still having breakfast probably and said hey come he's not there and so peter and john john remember the disciple whom jesus loved they ran to the tomb pell-mell john was younger than peter got there first he looked in and he saw the linen wrappings lying there but nobody in them and then peter puffing away behind john arrived. He went inside the cave and he saw for himself that the linen wrappings were lying there and the napkin which had been around the head of Jesus was carefully folded up. He saw it and began to make sense of it. And then John, who's still lingering outside, comes in as well. And he saw and he believed. Now he understood the scriptures that had forecast the resurrection of Jesus. Why do I go through it all in that punctilious detail? Because for a very simple reason, every single moment in that series of events is captured by one word in English, a three letter word, saw. The women saw, John saw, Peter saw, and John saw and believed. What a poor thing the English language is. The word saw used four times, but there are three different verbs in Greek. And each verb 
spells out a message that takes us more and more deeply into the mystery. So the women arrive. They see. What is that kind of seeing? A simple act of being able to see rather than being blind. Opening your eyes in the morning and seeing your bedroom around you. Looking around the corner to see if your cup of coffee is coming. All the simple faculties of sight. But the second verb, the uh, one where Peter goes in, sees and draws from what he sees, uh, an understanding that's much richer than simply seeing it, physical sight, he sees and he understands. A different verb in Greek. And when John goes in the second time, he now has implode on him an understanding that not only as with Peter, affects his mind, his ability to work it out cognitively. But indeed, it gets into his soul as well. For in a favorite coupling of verbs that St. John likes to use more than once, he sees and believes. A seeing, in John's case, this second time, is something that pierces his very soul. So seeing as a mere physical faculty, seeing as working something out in your head, and seeing as something that helps you to understand that your life will never be the same again. All that is part of the resurrection story. Vain the stone, the watch, the seal. Christ hath burst the gates of hell. <laughs> Hallelujah. Mm. Hallelujah. That was Charles Wesley, of course. Nobody ever said it better than he. <laughs> but let's, let's go back to these verbs again for a minute. Before we came to live in Croydon, Margaret and I lived 200 yards from Moorfields Hospital. Now, I have a lot of gratitude for Moorfields Hospital because I have had two cataracts removed from my eyes, but in the bit of Moorfields, the eye hospital that works in Croydon. They have a clinic there. But we live 200 yards from the actual physical headquarter hospital. And Margaret and I, at a certain moment, we registered. I've got to look at this very carefully because I must get the formula right. We, we, we registered for a study uh, that was described as using a special high-resolution imaging instrument to examine the retina with the aim of making an earlier and more reliable diagnosis of age-related macular degeneration. In other words, make sure we didn't go blind. Now, there we had a focus on the faculty of sight, keeping your eyes healthy, ensuring that when you raised your lids, you could see something. And, and that's the very first level of seeing. But beyond that, when we go into it a little bit further, we have the seeing that generates a whole pile of little phrases that we use. The penny dropped. I saw, and what I saw allowed the penny to drop. Or two and two makes four. I can work it out now. Or something clicked. Or the truth sank in. Or, ah, now I see. And clearly you're going in all those instances well beyond merely the faculty of sight. And Peter saw in this way, a penny dropped. That's what Jesus was talking about. Those were the hints he was giving us. This is what it's all come to. He's not here. Margaret and I are very fond of detective crime thrillers. And during this period of enforced idleness, we are re-watching our favorite of all favorites, Endeavor, the young Inspector Morse, and then Morse itself, and then finally Lewis, who was, of course, Morse's sidekick. An endless number of detective crime stories based in Oxford. If all the murders that have happened in Oxford in this series actually happened, there'd be nobody living in Oxford now. But the trick with all these crime thrillers is that in the first five minutes, 
a sequence of clues is laid before the, the, the viewer. And you're supposed to hang on to as much of that as you can. And then the detective work goes on. And then the detective sees the clues that line up, gets the dots lined up in a row. And he has an epiphany. Ah, now I see. I know who did the murder. That's what they're all about. And it's that kind of understanding that Peter has. That's what it's all about. Now I can make sense. They were jigsaw pieces before, and I now see the picture. When I was a boy on Saturday morning on radio, there was children's radio. I was very fond of it. We didn't get a radio until I was about 12 or 13. Um, but I remember one of the songs that Danny Kay, I don't know if anybody watching this can remember Danny Kay, but he used to sing the ugly duckling. And poor little ugly duckling had been brought up by a group of ducks. And they made him feel quite different from the rest of them. Well, the little swan continued to develop until the differences got bigger and bigger. The other ducks laughed at him. But one day, one day on the river, a passing duck, uh, a passing, well, let me get this right, a passing swan looked at him with great admiration. For it was obvious to the swan that this wasn't an ugly or any other kind of duckling. The doors of perception had been opened, a penny had dropped, it began with his eyes, it sank into his understanding, the realization deepened, and he ended by claiming the truth for himself, this little ugly duckling. As the song puts it, he looked, and he saw, and he said, gee, I am a swan. I never forgot that, never forgotten it. Those levels of perception that take you more and more deeply into what your eyes began by telling you, but in the end, your heart demands a response from you. You're seeing with something more than eyes by the time you've got there. Well, you can see where all this is going, can't you? It's uh, simply uh, trying to unpack the dynamic of that first Easter morning as a group of dispirited people feeling that they were gathered to do the obsequies, the last rites for their dead friend, find that their dead friend has yet again startled them yet again shown that he's ahead of the game, that he's no longer where they predict he should be. He will not just subject himself to their expectations. So it's a great, great story. It is the resolution of all those moments that we spent looking at the nature, the character, the attributes of Jesus all manifest on that cross. Now, there is a passage earlier in John, and I must refer to it before I finish. It's in chapter 12, and it's uh, a moment of understanding that the disciples had, a kind of prediction. We, with hindsight, we can see how it all fits together. The hour has come, and it's in, in Jerusalem, Feast of the Passover, and Jesus is on the spot, he's being interrogated by the authorities. The hour has come, says Jesus, for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, aha, if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life will lose it. Those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. When I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. The cross of Jesus is a symbol through which God is calling the whole of humanity to understand the rules of engagement, the nature of human life in all its fullness that's on offer in the words of St. John's Gospel. Well, I'm just interested in that. I remember 
when um, we were um, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Kingsway Hall, where Donald Soper, the great open air speaker, had been the minister. And they told me the story of how they built it. It was 100 years previously. It had been, at that time, uh, in the middle of the prostitute, the red light area of London. And they knocked down all the old tenement buildings that had been there for three or four hundred years in order to find a spot on which to build this preaching hall. They left that land fallow once they'd knocked those tenement buildings down for one year. <laughs> and astonishing what happened. Trapped in the mortar, trapped in the walls of those buildings that had stood there for centuries were seeds, seeds that were of their day. And there they were scattered on this fallow ground, left empty for a year, and they blossomed in the spring and in the early summer with flowers that hadn't been seen in Britain for hundreds of years. The people from Kew Gardens came and got the seedlings and all the rest of it. And I was astonished at how those seeds that had lain fallow and dead within the mortar, the cement of those buildings, still had their life force in them. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it remains, it bears its proper fruit. When I am lifted up, the seed of my life will flourish as the tree of life and all people will be drawn to it. So now let me just finish with one last little illustration. And again, a personal one. I remember when I was just in my first job, I'd been asked to go off to the capital city, Cardiff, to give a talk to students there. They'd been my friends. And I walked into this dull, dark room on a November evening, and there were all my friends. And warming her hands at a coal-fired stove was someone I'd never met before. And the room lit up. I saw, and I saw and understood, and I saw and my heart was changed. The girl who was to become my wife. It was love at first sight across a crowded room. So all those things happened to me in that moment. And I knew, I knew just what all those levels of perception are all about. Saw so we now where Christ hath led, following our exa exalted head. Made like him, like him we rise. Ours, the cross, the grave, the skies. Alleluia. Amen. Alleluia. Amen. Amen.